Hi, my name is Manuel Quintana, Senior Product Engineer at Pragmatic Works. Hi, I'm Michael Harper, one of the support engineers here at Pragmatic Works. So today, we're going to bring you a video for our product, Task Factory. Specifically, we're going to be honing in on a component known as the RESTful API source. That's a good one. That's a good one. Now, APIs, RESTful APIs as a service, we're talking so many different options. So we have to hone in and refine. Today, what's the topic for today? Uh, so we're going to take a look at the Salesforce REST API, actually. And a little bit of a disclaimer, we do have Salesforce-specific components mm -hmm. in the Task Factory suite, the source and the destination. Those actually reference, uh, they leverage the SOAP API, uh, yes. which are really good for pulling and pushing data from your Salesforce objects. Uh, so wonderful if you're doing data warehousing, wanted to bring that information in, or wanted to load more information to Salesforce. Mm -hmm. uh, but the REST API actually has a different set of functionality that you can do with it. Uh, there's yeah. some creation that can occur. There's some more metadata uh, interpretation that you can do. Uh, so just two different tools that yeah. accomplish two different goals. Extends so, the functionality more. So. Absolutely. So when you're thinking about this, you just have to decide what it is you're looking to do. Mm -hmm. And the place you'll go to figure that out. Where? API Reference Guide. Oh, now, I'm just saying okay. API Reference Guide because for anybody out there, if you're watching this for any other sort of API services you want to connect to, you are going to have an API Reference Guide. Yeah, and hopefully. This, this is, I mean, this is critical. This is where you're going to get everything you need. This is where you set up the ability to even authenticate. It gives you those how to do that. Okay. Um, what are the endpoints? What can I do? So if you are already using our Salesforce source and you're wondering, well, what else could the rest do for me? Uh, Michael mentioned a couple. You know, we have the ability to create objects, delete objects. That can be really effective if you're kind of starting from a new instance and you're trying to build it up. Yeah, um, yeah. But this is where you need to go. So really, that's what we're going to focus on right now. We're going to start off and show you the Salesforce API reference guide. And in the beginning, if we look right here, we're going to hone in on the first tab is really good introducing us, and it explains how the difference, how SOAP is being leveraged. But we want to go into the link called Understanding Authentication. This is going to explain how we're using OAuth 2. And then that really is just going to give you a nice rundown so you have an understanding. So I'd say go here first if you're not familiar with it, and it'll explain the first step that needs to be accomplished. And up until now, everything's pretty much the same across all APIs. You can go mm -hmm. into the REST API documentation. There's going to be an authentication. They might call it authorization. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's going to be a section in there telling you either it's going to be OAuth 2. We can also actually do OAuth 1 or basic authentication yes. within our REST source as well. So keep an eye out for those terms. Uh, but at this point, this is where it gets all crazy and gets Salesforce specific. Okay? Mm -hmm. So with Salesforce, the first step you actually need to do is go to this Defining Connected Apps tab right underneath Understanding Authentication. These steps here are going to show you how to set up an app through your Salesforce instance that allows you to, it kind of acts as an agent for yeah. you to communicate with that REST API between SSIS and the Salesforce web service. So on these steps here, you're going to walk through it. We're going to make a connected app. Honestly, I want to show them where to find it because the first yeah. time I did it, I had no idea what I was looking for. So if you were to log into your Salesforce.com instance, and you're on the home page here, if you go to the top right, there's a setup tab. On the left-hand side of that screen, after you click setup, uh, you're going to see Administer, and then there's going to be Build. Under Build, we're looking for Create, and we're going to create an app. So we go to that page, and at the bottom of that app page, you're going to see Connected Apps. Now, as you can see here, we already made a REST source connected app for us mm -hmm. to use today. Uh, for everyone at home, you want to click that New button there. And that New button, then you can follow all the steps on that Defining Connected Apps. Yeah. It's very straightforward at that point. just took me a little time to find it. Uh, the biggest things to pay attention to when you're setting up these is uh, obviously the, the access that you give to the REST API, which the, the web page that uh, we showed you before talks about the different types of access. Mm -hmm. uh, but then the things that you set up yourself are going to be that callback URL, uh, which yes. we're going to refer to as redirect URL in our component. Very important to know this. It's going to be used as part of both the authorization and the access token call. So you need to know what you set up there. Uh, the other two pieces of information that are vital to us is going to be this consumer key. Yeah. and going to be the consumer secret as well. Um, now, you might see API key, you might see API secret, or you might see um, uh, like a client ID or client secret, things yeah. of that nature. Key and secret are going to be the two terms you're going to look for when you're working with yeah. REST APIs, and those are going to be like your username and Pretty password. Pretty universal. Those are the most commonly seen. Absolutely. Um, and you can see we created some of our own when we talk about the callback URIs down here at the bottom. Um, specifically, they have some, this can be anything, sure. anything you yeah. want. Um, Salesforce, you'll notice in the reference guide, does leverage the top two we have, the login and the test.salesforce. Um, but honestly, this is just going to uh, be a container that's going to receive the, the uh, access code we need 
um, to get the token. Now, mm -hmm. I know there was a lot of, if you're unfamiliar with APIs, the, the whole token and um, codes, that might be a little foreign to you. So before we actually dive into our connection manager and show you how easy we're handling this in the background, let's go back over to the um, API reference guide and go down a little bit in understanding the web server OAuth authentication flow. And we'll be able to see some of those elements that we just saw and how we are doing this. So you have a good understanding. We're going to go and make a call to the authorization request URI and we're going to uh, approve. We have to log in with an account yep. and then we're going to return a code. And then that code is going to be taken, mm -hmm. and we're going to send out another request through the REST source. Mm -hmm. And that's actually what's going to be getting the access token back for us. So we're going to talk to Salesforce once. They're like, all right, cool, use this code. Let me know if you know what to do with it. We're going to yes. say, yeah, we know what to do with that code. And we're going to say, hey, give us that access token. They're like, all right, cool, thank you. And they're going to give us that access token back. Um, well, and that's, that's crib. I mean, at the end of the day, that's what we need. Absolutely. An access token is what's going to give us that capability to query these endpoints. Mm -hmm. um, now, Salesforce actually goes a little bit further, and uh, we're going to see that we do need to leverage a refresh token. True. Because there is a limitation of time that this is active. Okay. So that, uh, that it's not broken apart as far as if we're having long-running queries so that we're not interrupted in that process. Right. They have a nice, smooth transition for that. So if you are uh, leveraging other types of APIs and using this as a reference video, just go in and you'll look and you'll see, do I need a refresh token or do I not? And at the end of the day, that's all that's required. Right. Certain sites give you a token and that's good for a year maybe. Absolutely. And that's all you need. Well, now that you've got this uh, beautiful flowchart, we'll uh, send you on your way. Hopefully you can get it all set up uh, and uh, we'll see you later. Uh, farewell. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> we're just kidding, we're just kidding. There's actually a little bit more. Uh, a little slightly bit more few smidgen, other steps. smidgen, smidgen. But most of this is going to be handled by our source. But let's actually take a look at what that's going to look like in Visual Studio. How are we going to actually use these things in there? Absolutely. So what we've got here, we've already pre-set up this. But don't worry, we're going to go through every little bit and piece of it. So, you know, Michael talked about the connected apps. That's already set and done, hopefully. You got perfect, that set up. You, you know your key, you know your secrets, you, got, right. you know your redirect URI. So now we need to leverage that information in the connection manager. And we talked about OAuth, OAuth2, and a standard REST connection. But when we go into the source itself, we're going to have and see this capability at the top that we can choose which type. So right. we can see right here, I'm pointing to the one we've created, but I have the ability to create new ones. We're going to hone in and show you the one we've already created, but we'll go into detail on it. Absolutely, absolutely. So let me bring that up here. We've got the connection manager, and we can see I've already populated my API key. Perfect. And my secret. So those are the two bits of information that we mentioned that you'd need, that we do have, that's in there. The access token, I mentioned that's the golden thing. That's what we need. We already have it because we've already set this up, but you're not. Right. Now. We're going to have to actually use yep. the token getter that we have built in here. So if you click that get token button, uh, we're going to actually have this new screen pop up, and it's going to give us all of the fields we're, that are going to be required to make those calls and work through that flowchart that we saw before. Mm -hmm. uh, fortunately, we've taken the time to actually create a config file yes. uh, for us, and if you choose that choose, choose settings drop down, you can see there's a couple of them already set up in there. Uh, we're going to use that Salesforce REST.oauth. Uh, in the future, if you want to make your own configuration files, these are actually found in the uh, C Program Files 86, uh, Pragmatic Works Task Factory. OAuth2 mm -hmm. configuration files folder. Uh, you can open it up and then actually just look at the context that we have here. Hopefully this video here will give you some information on how to do that. Yeah. And you could create your own. Uh, so once we've selected the Salesforce REST OAuth uh, configuration file, uh, we're going to want to customize uh, three items here. Uh, two of them within the authorization request and one within the access token request. Uh, the first one within that authorization request is going to be that redirect URI or callback URL uh, that we mentioned before. Uh, you're just going to want to remove the HTTPS uh, pragmatic works that we have set up in the configuration file and put in whichever callback URL you provided to that connected app. Uh, the second half of the authorization request that we're going to need to change is going to be the scope. Now, scope is something that's discussed in that Salesforce reference guide. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a dozen, if not more, different types of scopes that you can actually leverage when making this authorization call. Yes. And the one that is super important, almost imperative, you would say, yeah. uh, is the refresh token scope. That, yes. That's what's actually going to tell the REST API that we want to have access to a refresh token so we can extend that session and continue making calls Correct. in case our process takes a little bit longer than a normal session would take. Uh, now, like I said, there's a dozen or so more. These are all going to be added into the URL, if you use multiple of them, mm -hmm. by using a, an ampersand. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to add full, which we recommend as another uh, scope to use. And then instead of using the actual ampersand, do a percent %20, because that's your HTTP encoded version of ampersand. Yep. Last thing that we're going to need to change here inside of the access token request 
uh, query string, uh, there's going to be a redirect URI here as well. Put in the same redirect URI that you put in the authorization request. Again, that has to be one of the callback URLs that you defined in your connected app. Uh, and really, that's all there is to it with this configuration file that we've made. Uh, yeah. Yeah, there's a couple small things, and for those who are really observant, you might have seen it. You know, we're talking about placeholders and changing elements. You might have seen something like this example we see right here, where it says, uh, you know, within brackets, API secret. Oh, what's that going to do? Well, effectively, this is going to be a variable. What we're doing is we're taking the values that we've populated in that client slash API key and the client slash API secret, um, and we've taken those, and they're going to then, at runtime, they're going to be populated into this full string. Making nice, life nice. easy, right? You, yeah. know, you want to make things a little more dynamic. You don't want to have to put that atrocious uh, <laughs> API key. I haven't memorized. In there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, but this will take care of that for you. That'll make it nice and easy. So for those of you who are going to create your own configura configuration file, uh, leverage this. Make sure you utilize this to make your life easier. You can see um, it's just going to be API secrets. We also have um, grant code is going to be for uh, representing the value that is returned on our first call. Those will be the main ones you'll leverage. And like I, as Michael said, you'll see it in the configuration files. Just make a copy of one we already have Perfect. and simply replace the value such as what is the request URI? What is our request token URL string? Those parameters. Just change those, leave everything else the same to make life easy, and then you're on your way. Smarter, not harder, right? Exactly, exactly. So there's one last thing we need to do on this page, obviously. We've got all the information. We've set up the redirect URI. We need to get the token. That's what this is all about. Important thing to note is that we are doing a post here. Mm -hmm. uh, that post is being is is known from the reference API. Yes. Uh, reference guide. Excuse me. Uh, that's what Salesforce uses whenever we do the authorization request. Uh, so maybe to use a get, you have that option there for you as well. Uh, but so man, we've clicked get token. What what are we seeing now though? So this is where we saw in that uh, workflow for the authorization where we've gone and we've hit the endpoint to right. ask for authorization via the app, and we need to provide credentials, a user account that has access to this. So we have uh, Michael's username here. He's the one who set up the app, so he is um, naturally uh, given access to this. Right. So all we need to do is include a password, and then we can log right in. Now what's occurring here is it's accessing all the information, and for those of you at home who are going through this for the first time, it will have taken the code. Mm -hmm. With that code, it's going to make the secondary call to get the access token, and it will populate it for you right here. And there's one other thing. Well, and when you make that call for the first time, uh, after you put that password in mm -hmm. the, the integrated browser that you see there, it may actually ask you to allow permissions Correct. the first time, which is that something happens the very first time you make the call. After that, you won't have to do it again. So if that comes up, just make sure you say allow for those permissions. And those permissions are defined by not only what you allow the connected app to do, Correct. but also the scope that you gave as well. And if you change the scope in between calls, that permission screen will actually pop up every time because depending on scope, we used full. There's mm -hmm. other variants there. Um, it's verifying, okay, you want to access these aspects of the API, and you just can hit allow. Or mm -hmm. deny is there, but sure. you probably know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, last thing we need to check, though, is that refresh token tab. So mm -hmm. we've got the, all the access token filled out. And then this refresh token tab also gets filled out by that configuration file. And we just want to test and make sure that that refresh token is being returned properly. Uh, once we see that it is, we can hit OK. And we actually dive into configuring those endpoints and actually trying to get that data back from the REST API. So we know that it's taken a little bit to get to this point, but it's really all about the connection manager. Once yeah. this is done, it's all down here. It's just downhill just getting the information. Make this a project connection manager. Make it easy on yourself and use the rest of your packages for this. So. How do we kind of, we're going to break apart, um, dissect, if you will, what our API endpoint is. So I'm sure. going back into the source. We can see we have endpoint URL. And okay. like Michael pointed out before, when we were doing the get, uh, token getter, we had the option of posting or getting. Mm -hmm. Well, that same option is going to be available for us for the endpoint, except we also have uh, put as well as delete. Mm -hmm. So that's what we mentioned in the beginning, how we have additional functionality here via API. Absolutely. So we can create new objects and we can delete. This is not the endpoint for that. But we have the option so we can make that type of call. Mm -hmm. So here is our API endpoint. So what this is doing here. Now, from this point on, just after this 37.0, we're seeing that is the base URI. This is what's going to be used for all your API endpoints for Salesforce. There is one element here, though, that two, pardon me, two that need to be modified. Okay. One is required. And the second one, I'm going to say optional, and you'll see what I mean when we get there. Mm -hmm. But that's going to be this first portion just before salesforce.com, where we have NA30. 
when you are on the reference guide, if you're doing your homework and studying this like you should, it's mm -hmm. going to actually have a placeholder that says instance name. Okay, okay. So when, if you were to just copy it out of there, you need to replace that. So you at home, NA30 will not be the correct option. Um, so just, if you actually, if you go and you launch your instance on force.com and you look at that URL, so if we were to go back and visit our page, which Michael brought us to, we can see just here, this is our instance, this is where I acquired this information. And it's usually going to be a four-digit code of some sort. Two, two, yeah. two, uh, two. Usually it's region yeah, and, and then the value. Go. Yeah. So we have a North America is what it represents. So we've got that set up. So we plug that in. That is our instance. So make sure you get yours specifically. Um, moving on down the line, services data, that's going to be standard. Um, there is some differences here for a different base URI. If you're not just trying to acquire information, that's what okay. we talk about creating. But it's this portion. This is honing in specifically on API versions. Okay. So Salesforce I mean, API versions. Exactly. Okay. Uh, Salesforce does make available older versions. Um, they do deprecate, so it's kind of like a sliding scale here. Okay. But they do make available on the reference guide what APIs you can access. Um, and people might wonder why why not use the most recent? Yeah, what is the value in looking at some of the older ones? Well, you know, of course, as they're introducing new ones, they're introducing new functionality, but at the same time, sometimes they're deprecating old functionality. And there may be something, some type of functionality in an older version okay. that you want to acquire, that you want to get back, and it's no longer available. Interesting. So in that case, 27, 26, whatever version that might be, you simply input that value here. At the making of this video, I want to say the newest version is 38.0. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm but a 35 kind of guy. 35? Yeah, yeah. For what we're looking for, just to acquire the objects list, we could have effectively used um, any, I think, any active API right now in the entire Salesforce. But I think that's right. Yeah. So, so 37 was, we felt like 37 today. No, where could they find those different API versions or even the different endpoints that we're going to, because that S objects is actually what's defining our endpoint. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Yeah, that's the final, that's the very specific things because I want that list. Well, we're going back. We're, we're beating this over. To Cali? One more, no, we're, we're, this is one more time. This is a record on repeat. The reference guide. Oh, the reference okay. guide. Okay. So if you're unfamiliar, first time in, just dive in there. It's it actually has a very nice little quick access, so it teaches you the first like basic endpoints and okay. it tests you to use them. Nice. Um, so this is the one we want, and that's what we have set. So the endpoint now, this is in place. But what is this going to look like when we get it? So exactly and, and with our REST source, the first thing we do after you configure that endpoint is go to that test API section at the bottom and do a preview data so that we can see that raw response now. We're going to be concentrating on that bottom part, the raw response that you see here, because when you first make that call to the endpoint, that results grid is not going to be set up. And we're going to show you how to make that happen. Yes. Uh, so the, what we want to look at here in the raw response is understanding what we're looking at. And this is just basic JSON. Hopefully some of you are familiar. For those of you that are not familiar, uh, you've got a list of objects and arrays, essentially, that are being, um, you know, kind of um, hidden within one another. You mm -hmm. know? And so for those of you that are familiar with JSON, the root path and the JSON token path that we're going to look at in the JSON properties, that's going to be your JSON query that you would use to parse this information normally. Uh, for those of you that are not as familiar with JSON, uh, I recommend reading up on it a little bit so you yes. can understand how to write those queries a little better. Uh, but the basic concept here is to understand how you can drill down into uh, more uh, objects and more arrays inside Correct. there. So Correct. Uh, when I talk about the root uh, path, uh, what we're going to look at here is we're going to want to know what part of this JSON raw response do we want the REST source to iterate through? So we're going to yes. say, hey, look at this area of the raw response, and then with this token path that we're also going to give you, Correct. give me all of the values that match this token path yep. as well. So in this particular raw response that we're looking at, this S objects uh, array is what holds all of the different information that we need uh, concerning the metadata for our, our objects. Yes. Uh, as you can see, our result grid, we've had label and label plural mm -hmm. and, and name of these. Uh, in that large block of information that you see in the raw response, that's where we can find those. If you scroll down a little bit here, you see label, you see label plural, you see name there at the bottom as well. Queryable is another one. But you know, say we wanted to get out uh, deletable. We want to know mm -hmm. whether we can delete those or not. Yeah. So how would we do that? Well. Let's tie this all together by going and looking at those JSON properties and yes. showing you what we mean by that root path and the token path. So this is what we set up ahead of time and what you saw. That was that top grid above the raw response because we're parsing that information out. We labeled our root object. So we have that here, the S object that mm -hmm. contained all of those um, values that we wanted to return. So that's what we placed here. And then all I did was click add new output. So we talked about getting um, deletable. deletable, right? Yeah, yeah. 
Is that an English word? Is that <laughs> I don't know. Word? They just make know. this up for the for the API. And then here I'm just gonna I'm gonna just gonna put delete here for us. But that's what we did prior. We're adding this new one so you can see how this can change. You can also administer what type of data. So you can uh, vary data what types. data type it will yeah, be. Yeah. So here we've got this set and and very important to note, um, I know it looks like label plural if we hone in on that. Case sensitivity yeah. is critical. True. If true. not done correctly, you will actually receive an error. It will actually not parse the information out. You'll just see it blank. And you can see label right. plural, even though it looks odd here. That is how that is represented in the raw response. So I have to do that correctly. Very good point. Very so good if we point. swing back here, we preview again, we're going to see deletable now is going to pop up at the end, and I'm bringing back those mm -hmm. values. Perfect. So really, I mean, Connected apps, authorizations, we went through that, endpoints, yeah. and retrieving values. Connection manager, I mean, I mean, getting that data or getting that information uh, from that reference guide and then mm -hmm. setting up that connection manager, I mean, that's 90% of your work. Yes. You know, and then hopefully as you've been looking through that reference guide to find out how to set up that authentication and that authorization, you've happened across some endpoints. So yes. once you get that connected, it's just a matter of plug and play at that point, uh, you know. And there is one thing I wanted to bring to your attention. Okay. Even though we know everything at this point, we know all the adventures and ins and outs, and now you can go and go on your merry way and do whatever endpoint you want. Sure. In SSIS, it's all about making things dynamic, right? Mm -hmm. So as you delve into this and you get into more complex objects, there might be um, beyond Salesforce objects, you can actually pick a specific identity, so okay. a, a value that represents a specific object if you want to return those, that metadata only this endpoint is going to increase. And rather than needing to hard code all this information, we can make it dynamic. Oh, so just nice. so you know, if we see hovering over this, the formatting is simply as such. You're just going to uh, greater than sign, at sign, the namespace itself, colon, colon, followed by the variable name. Nice. And then cap it all off with a greater than sign so, as well. Yep. Uh, and, and it's also, we can also handle XML with the rest source too as well. So if, you're, if your REST API is going to be returning XML, uh, it's going to be the same way that we did the JSON, just you're going to have to write XPath query instead of JSON query. So mm -hmm. really the big difference there is that XPath is going to use forward slashes to separate your different elements, uh, as opposed to JSON using uh, periods yes. uh, to separate your different uh, arrays and objects. Uh, and I mean, it's just as simple as that. Yeah, yeah I mean, that's, that's really all we have here. So uh, hopefully you enjoyed this. Hopefully this was uh, valuable to you, uh, informational as well. Uh, and if you have any questions, feel free to comment down below. Uh, if you have any ideas as far as other web services that you would like to see how to connect to using the resource, feel free to leave a comment about that as well. We'll take a look at that. We'll try and make some yeah. more videos to make this an even more powerful tool uh, useful to your, your company as well. So uh, with that, I'm Michael. I'm Manuel. And uh, that's how you use the Task Factory resource to hit Salesforce API. And don't forget, teamwork makes the dream work.